Susan Zink with Montessori for Everybody TV. And in this segment, I'm going to talk about how we connect the great lessons into the zoology curriculum. And if you're not very familiar with the elementary level of the, the Montessori curriculum, there is a concept called cosmic education. And this is one of the places that it makes me so sad when I hear people say things like, oh, Montessori doesn't believe in imagination and it's not about creativity, because Montessori's vision of the way that the children use their imagination, their creativity, is so broad and so magical that it's just a travesty that people don't understand that aspect of this this way of doing education and the way that we approach it this cosmic curriculum is by introducing the entire natural world to the children through the great stories and we f it finish up those great stories with how man then has created things on the earth. So we start with the story of the universe and the story of the earth, sometimes one lesson, sometimes two, depending on your preference. Then we move into the coming of life and the timeline of life, which is what this segment's going to be about, and then moving into the coming of humans and then the coming of language and uh, number systems. So we start from absolutely natural, no, no beings except the forces of nature acting to the most intelligent creations on the earth or the most intelligent creatures on the earth acting on the earth and, and, and those key discoveries that allowed them to cooperate. Some of the most recent research says that's one reason why we as humans are so successful, that cooperation is the, the magic ingredient that we have. And through numbers, the, the basis of all of the architecture and the amazing scientific discoveries that have, have come since. So we start with this grand vision and then that's how we focus the children's imagination. What, what can you imagine about these animals? What do you imagine the dinosaurs would have been like? And then we connect it to the known knowledge. So we, we encourage them to research and direct their imagination in that way. So it doesn't mean that we're directing it into fantasy, neither are we preventing them from going into fantasy. It's just that that is a very natural offshoot but if we give them those, those real pieces, if we give them that understanding of the natural world, they have such a richer um, a set of material to draw from for the things that they create purely from their own imagination. So once we've done these great stories, then where do we go specifically with the zoology curriculum? Well, the zoology curriculum springs out of the coming of life, and the, the way that that lesson is done is with a timeline of life. So a timeline that is big history timeline, going back millions of years and showing the children when these different creatures emerged, and in some cases, like the trilobites or the dinosaurs, when they died out out when they went extinct and then other creatures emerged on the earth. Uh, connected with this is the movement of the continents on the earth. So when Pangaea was the, the continent on the earth, we, we show that period and then Gondwanda and all, into all these different ways that the earth was changing. So once you've done that great lesson, once you've introduced that work of the, the timeline of life, where do you go from there? And for a brief moment, I'm going to say, where did we come from there before? Um, because I believe you can introduce some elements of this with the younger children. Children ages three to six are interested in dinosaurs. I believe we need to be careful how much we go into there because of their um, maturing ability to distinguish fantasy and reality. We don't want to frighten them. We don't want to confuse them with things that it's harder for them to wrap their minds around because their ability to, to do abstract thought is still so limited. But they're interested, so we've got to find ways to help them understand that. So the first thing that I'm going to mention is that you can have objects from use with the timeline of life and then you can take these objects into the three to six classroom 
and simply talk about them. Now what I have here is I actually have them sorted out by plastic models and by real creatures because these are the remains of an abalone, uh, um, a sea star, excuse me, a sand dollar, a um, uh, mollusk whose name is not coming to my mind, a, 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 another uh, prehistoric creature, a trilobite, and a sponge. So when we would talk about these things, whether we only have plastic models of fossils or whether we have real um, fossils, we can talk to the children about the fact that these are not creatures that are living on the earth right now, particularly in the case of the trilobite, but these are the remains of that creature that lived on the earth millions of years ago. Now I have my little starfish, my excuse me, my seahorse in here because I haven't decided whether or not it's going to be part of this work. So that's kind of again showing you how I, I do some of the, the things that when I'm preparing uh, for the, the classroom year. So if the children have been introduced to some of these creatures in the three to six classroom, they're going to have some of that terminology. They're going to have some of the, the, the terms of the dinosaurs, some of the other prehistoric fossil creatures that we have fossil evidence for and could even have fossils that the children would handle in the classroom. So then where do we go from there? Well, the, the way that the timeline of life is traditionally done is that the children then have the chance to lay the pieces on the timeline in photo form because by the time you're doing that, you are, are out of the sensitive period for small objects. You're um, moved to the place where abstract thought and a desire to learn a lot about a subject are, are what are the developmental processes that are in play. But does that mean you can't have objects? Not at all. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use objects if you have them, even at that age group. And one of the things I'm going to mention just briefly, because um, we this segment is on zoology, is that any time that you are working with the timeline of life, even if the focus is on zoology, you still need to make sure that you're giving the context. So these are some pieces of evidence of the plant kingdom that we would want to talk about because understanding which living creatures emerged first, that life emerged in the sea, animal life emerged in the sea before we had plants on land, and then how the plants affected the creatures that, that the animals that um, developed on Earth, those are important pieces of understanding. This is one reason we don't block things off into boxes in the, the Montessori curriculum more than, than we have to. So what I have here are some models of prehistoric plants and one of the reasons I'm showing you these is this is an example, a great example of models that would be very appropriate to use even with elementary children because look at that 3D detail, look at how much they could understand about these plants that would be harder for them to get from um, uh, just a photo. So I think it's very worthwhile to provide that kind of material for them and then I'll just show these pieces, plant roots. Um, so what, what you, you see are minerals that replaced the, the, the tissue of plant prehistoric plant roots. And of course, what I have in my, my little bag is, is amber here. And the teeny tiny one actually has an insect uh, encased in, in the amber. And so that would be uh, obviously a, an important reason to have it as part of our zoology curriculum. And the reason I left it in the bag for filming, you know, that would be really easy to lose. So this is one of the ways I would have it in storage to make sure it didn't get lost down in the, the bottom of a box and not didn't make its way onto the shelf. So with these different models that we might have, we might have skulls, uh, uh, models of some of the prehistoric creatures. We might have sets of prehistoric creatures that are grouped by things like their biome. So this is prehistoric sea life, a, a, a safari tube. Look for ways to use those so that the children really get something out of it. 
Part of what we want them to get out of it is to be able to maybe examine high quality models. Some of the dinosaur models that are available now are museum quality reproductions of museum, uh, full size museum models that, that have, have been um, developed by skilled archaeologists and paleontologists. So you want to look for ways that this is going to really take them in depth, especially if this is an elementary child. How are you going to use that to take them in depth? And one of the things that you can do is you can have them match at this age. And the reason that this is a different level, so I've got little models here and I've got some cards that, that are the, the same creatures. One of the reasons this is at a different level is because these are unfamiliar creatures to the children. You know, to match a dog to an animal card, that's very much three to six work. But at this level, if they're matching to, to a picture that's not just, especially if it's not a photograph of that model, that takes a little bit more to, to look and it's going to draw them into the detail of those creatures. And I bring this up after having taught in public Montessori schools where two populations of children come in that make this kind of adaptation of the traditional Montessori curriculum really important. One is that a lot of charter schools, Montessori and otherwise, attract families whose children were not happy and were not successful in the, the schools in their neighborhoods. And so a lot of times these are children who have some learning challenges. They may not be reading at the level that most of their age peers are. And they certainly probably, or many of them, would not be reading at the level that children who'd spent three years in the three to six classroom and then maybe were in their second year of an elementary classroom, they certainly wouldn't be reading at that level. So how do we teach the cultural curriculum to these children? And then the second group are children who are coming into Montessori later on. So a child who comes into a Montessori six to nine classroom as an eight or nine year old is probably not going to have a lot of the the cultural subjects knowledge from the Montessori curriculum may have some reading challenges. How do we reach these children? How do we help these children be successful with that curriculum? How do we get them excited about the topics of cosmic education? One way is by having them be able to work with their peers in a productive way. So if you have things like this where you're matching models to cards or models to labels and you've got children who are able to read, helping children who aren't, you're going to see some wonderful cooperation happening there. You're going to see children going to those who are able to read, or and, and you're going to see those who are able to read but maybe don't have the dinosaur knowledge going to those who have some dinosaur background. And just some really wonderful cooperation can happen when we've got these kinds of, of interaction going on. So if you've got models, make sure you're using them in a, a way that makes sense. Make sure that you have some of your early humans. I'm not going to pull it out, but if you're familiar with the dinosaur tubes, you know there are some early humans figures that are also available from, from that same um, group. Use those things to help the children understand. Group them by vertebrates and vertebrates. Group them by biomes of the ancient um, time. Match them to, their, uh, to the cards that match them. And then the last thing that I want to say about tying, oops, excuse me, um, tying together the, the great stories with the follow-up work is you're looking for ways to get children excited. You want them to want to know more than what you're telling them. So you want them to read the cards on the shelf. You want them to read the books on the shelf. You want them to write and draw and create presentations to give to one another. How do we get maybe the ones that don't just naturally flow into that extended uh, follow-up work, how do we get them excited? Well, games are one way. Um, this is Paleo Pals from Aristoplay. I honestly don't even know if the game still exists, but there are certainly dinosaur games out there that would be a, a possibility. Um, this is Cruising the Fossil Freeway map from Ray Troll and Kirk Johnson. I would say this is part of your parent education. If, if your school is within a day of any fossil um, areas, and that's very likely that's the case, maybe not, but very likely, you, it would be wonderful in May to encourage your parents over the summer to look for ways to take the children to, to see some of these 
um, dinosaur digs and, and things like that, or at least a natural history museum. And then the last resource that I want to show you <clears throat> has to do with what I've talked about before about meeting you as the Montessori educator where you are, as well as meeting your children where you are. This is the geological time, a geological time and the history of life, illustrated animals and plants of North and South America. And this is from Ancient Life Publishing, ancientlifepublishing.com, Buffalo, Wyoming. And I love this because in one easy to store, easy to read tool, you've got kind of a quick rundown of the timeline of life. Um, it's easier for you to take it home, look at the different names of the creatures, sit there with Google, look them up, <laughs> uh, make sure that you're able to pronounce them correctly before you're working with the children, that you have some understanding of uh, the ages and the periods, so when you're discussing the, the big picture of time that you're able to do it with some intelligence. So that's the last resource that I'm going to leave you with in this segment. The timeline of life, the, the coming of life story, is a wonderful way to get children excited about the zoology curriculum, the botany curriculum, and just all of the aspects of life on our earth and how they interact. Make sure that you use that to the fullest. Give those great lessons with enthusiasm and joy, and then make sure you've got work on your shelf that encourages that follow-up. It's going to release those children's imagination with rich, rich material to, to feed it so that the creations that they make are interesting to other people, rewarding to them, and a great part of their education.